want to acknowledge that this institution um, is the American Museum of Natural History is very much um, a part of me. I worked there as an undergrad and as a genetics uh, intern. I worked there through through graduate school. Um, and then, you know, as mentioned in anthropological education for, for, for 10 years. So I worked very hard there um, uh, to, to push what we were doing in terms of representing race and culture. Um, and and that, that, that work and that institution is very, very much in my blood. So, this is also very much in my blood. <laughs> Gin martinis uh, with Andrew Hill. So um, I guess I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I had a phenomenal PhD advisor um, at Yale um, and he's looking unusually stern on the, on the top there, but you know, it was a it seemed like a mixed match. He was an old school British paleoanthropologist. Um, but he changed my life and was the most encouraging mentor I could imagine. Um, perhaps even if I may, as like a small interpersonal um act of anti-racist anthropology. Um, he uh took me um um, with him to Kenya many times. He introduced me to people at the National Museums of Kenya um, and to people in various South African um, museums. And he supported me when I made a pretty radical shift from being an evolutionary genet uh, geneticist to studying the representation of physical anthropology in old uh, museums after doing well on my qualifying exams. Um, but he was so incredibly supportive of, of my work at Yale and, th and through my career. I think he was the second call I would always make um, after getting a new job at, at, at AMH and then at Bryn Mawr in 2015. Um, and I had other great uh, mentors um, at, at Yale, Eric Warby and Ann Underhill and took classes with Hazel Carby. So there are other figures, but um, I just want to acknowledge Andrew here um, and may he rest in peace. So another part of my uh, formation, um, the last bit of autobiography, but relevant here as I, as I return to Yale. Um, I also must credit the Yale Peabody Museum for introducing me to museum work fostering my passion for museums um, and working on this um, then permanent human evolution exhibition of fossil fragments. And I, I share this photo um, that my parents so proudly took of me next to a sign um, of, of my title as Andrew's curatorial assistant for the human evolution exhibition. Um, and, you know, I'm not being overly indulgent. I think these are really formative, powerful, formative moments for me. And I'm also acknowledging them as privilege, this, um, the privilege that these Yale roots um, and experiences gave, gave to me and give to me. So, um, Another, I suppose, certainly formative uh, moment. We're at a critical, critical time here in museums and battles over race and class and image and ideology have been brought to the fore over the past few years by decolonized this place activists. Um, and as an anthropologist that studies museums, I've been thinking about the significance of them historically and today. Um, thinking them as uh, producing powerful uh, rhetoric in the construction of an idea of, of or of an ideal um, about race, racial progress, racial hierarchies, and anthropology exhibits um, have certainly presented um, in, in, in historically uh, uh, an image of Africa, an imaginary image of Africa, the heart of darkness the African evolutionary extraordinary, that evolutionary uh, African uh, primitive 
of spectacle. And I think these are, you know, deeply held imaginings of Africa and people of African descent, um, static and, and primitive. Um, and these are, and the museums used visual codes and semiotic codes that after years of recycling are somewhat stuck. Uh, they've become entrenched in ways in the popular imagination. And many people have written on this. Um, and fuel white supremacy in ways big and small. And, you know, I, I, why are we still having to argue that Black Lives Matter and what legacy does that have in 19th century museum work? and in um, the work of eugenicists and race scientists that worked um, and helped to found these institutions. And, um, you know, what persistent residues are there of, of that, of that, of those figures um, in, in museums today and in, in the larger cultural matrix of which they are part? Uh, and how do we, a collective we, reconcile deeply entrenched pseudoscientific ideas about how black lives do not indeed matter. And for me, this particular moment we're in have been as a country where we've seen white nationalism on the rise, where blackness is devalued and, and naturalized in the public imagination, where myths about blackness fuel po police violence and public policy. I have to think about where it comes from, how museums and anthropology um, helped construct that idea, these racial hierarchies with blackness on the bottom. Um, and, and how do we kind of rec reconcile these, um, these, these persistent notions of, and pseudoscientific notions of, of how black lives do not, um, indeed matter. So I also, um, so I've been kind of working in this industry of decolonizing museums, of helping museums become more diverse and inclusive. Um, but why do I say in the title of my talk, the myths of decolonizing? So decolonize has become a, a metaphor for um, destabilizing white supremacy in public spaces and institutions. And I've used it, I've used it again and again and found it useful. Um, but I've come to think about this differently of late for a few reasons. Number one, my own decolonization fatigue, the word fatigue, the, the overuse of the word. I mean, I think that I would not be surprised if Starbucks puts out a new flavor of, of, of coffee on its own, you know, decolonized Starbucks coffee special blend. But also my second reason is that um, my research of late um, on the history of African objects in anthropology museums is actually a spe specific focus on the political histories of objects. Um, you know, specific archival research um, on the intersection between collecting and um, colonialism. So, you know, in some ways it's not actually decolonizing as a broad political act, it's recentering um, colonization in some ways. And third, and most importantly, um, this, this article, uh, the title decolonization um, is not, a metaphor. Um, I really want to thank my colleague at Bryn Mawr, the college archivist, um, Allison Mills, um, for shifting my thinking about the the wording decolonizing and um, and sharing this article in particular, which describes um, um, decolonizing as. Uh, a, as um, a specific act that brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. Um, it is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies. Um, and as a side note, I just want to say that this was only brought to my attention um, at this level because in Allison, I'm in conversation and collaboration with a First Nations Cree scholar who, shift, who, who, who shifted my language and, and my way of thinking. So representation matters. 
So let's talk about um, evolutionary anthropology. So many of you are familiar with, with these images, um, this, this history, and it's important to bear in mind the important historical work of images of Africa in the museum and in anthropology, um, which I'll briefly just mention here through a long history of world fairs, such as the African villages and the 1893 Colombian exposition. Um, the hot and tot Venus, the Khoisan woman on display around Europe in the early 19th century, um, and Oda Benga, the quote unquote pygmy exhibited at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair and in 1906 at the Bronx Zoo. African peoples have been used to perform race according to the whims of a Western ontological quest as many have um, noted. And you know, while a, a, a grad student, I also became really concerned with um, museum representations of, of Africa in um, human evolution exhibitions um, and uh, natural history museums, particularly those at the American Museum of Natural History, which um, started with the 1924 Hall of the Age of Man. Um, by the um, noted um, paleontologist and eugenicist Henry Fairfield Osborne. Um, but also as part of my dissertation research um, at museums such as the Natural History Museum in London, which included this diorama um, as part of its otherwise very progressive uh, human evolution exhibition. Um, and then also by perspectives from doing a, a pilot study in South Africa and at the South African uh, Museum. So these early kind of bioanthropological stories constructed through images in many ways created the visual regimes or rhetoric about Africa, which have contributed to and contribute to cultural and ontological understandings of race and blackness, reasoning that informed and allowed for practices of slavery and that continue to perpetuate forms of social dominance and material disenfranchisement as Jennifer Gonzalez's work has helped me articulate. So again, you know, working at, at AM and H um, after, you know, after my postdoc, I, you know, I continue to think about Kind of the the residues of 19th century race science on rep on 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 representations of Africa um, in the museum, but also thinking about how I could intervene in some of those um, those those misconceptions. But as you can see here, uh, museums uh, and maybe A M H in particular, and so uh, now museums always, I think, communicate in imaginary Africa um, by nature of 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 the reductive um, metonymic landscape of the museum exhibition. Um, but as part of the African. Um, kind of evolutionary meta narrative that people uh, like Mickey Ball have talked about. You move from, you know, the, the entrance of the museum and the Teddy Roosevelt statue and him flanked by, you know, the, the, the African <laughs> and the Indian um, you, up, up through the main entrance and immediately into the hall of African peoples with dioramas, um, you know, of, 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 of gorillas and the parade of African elephants and almost directly around the corner into the hall of uh, African peoples with dioramas such as, some, such as these here, the top left one of pygmies, um, in, in the rainforest. So sub-Saharan African people uh, still being confined to the imagined jungles and plains. Um, um, and and the, or, the exhibition is organized in, on evolutionary determinism um, that pleases people are defined by the, 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 the different uh, landscapes that they're in. Um, no mention of Johannesburg, Nairobi cities. Um, and then also, you know, we go downstairs to the Hall of Human Origins, um, and which with visitors have meant, mentioned to me in my research that 
the dioramas in particular um, do uh, reinforce this idea of evolution moving in a teleological timeline from darker <laughs> Uh, to white, and it's a problem with ending with one representation of modern humans, these people from um, uh, uh, from the Ukraine. So uh, the current, hopefully soon past political moment, um, something else that pains me and is, has been formative. So this is a group of Confederate supporters voicing opposition to the removal of a Confederate monument in 2017. And this is a moment when, this has been a moment when you poignantly, painfully realize, again, that a monument is not just um, a monument. Charlottesville taught us that our work is not only about the preservation of museum objects it's 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 uh for those of us working in museums it's 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 to find a, a our voice in a country that is using symbols like monuments to fight race wars um to use confederate monuments to enact the ugliest forms of anti-black racism um and so the teddy roosevelt monument is not just a neutral monument of course so increasingly my work in uh, in museum anthropology uh, was no longer academic in that sense. It always has, it always has been more than academic, but it, it is um, more political. Um, and, you know, as a black woman and as an anthropologist and as a, a, a human being, um, I'm deeply troubled by recent, you know, popular and political discourse about Africa and blackness over the past four years, including much other forms of um, um, racism and xenophobia. But there has been a sort of bombardment of blatant and pseudoscientific um, racism and with along with this rise of white uh, nationalist violence, um, including the police killing of innocent black people. Oh gosh, let's look at some examples. I'm gonna run through them really quickly. Um, there's probably, there's like hundreds more, but some of the things I, 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 I felt deeply were things like um, Trump, you know, uh, basically reduces uh, African um, countries or places in the African di diaspora as shithole countries. Um, um, and, and Coulter's um, social Darwinist claims that in the history of the world, there has never been um, a, <laughs> it's hard to read. Um, there's never been a less rapey creature than the white male of European um, descent. Uh, um, and, you know, of course, there is a whole, um, you know, there's the Obamas were continually um, um, depicted as as primates. And some of this is not particularly new. Black people have been um, have have been bestialized in popular media and film and fashion and marketing and sports. Um, in, in, in for many, many years. Um, I actually was interested to learn that the Wikipedia definition of monkey chance actually has to do with this common phenomenon in football or in soccer. Um, and museums continue to be a part of that public sphere, continuing to traffic in outdated racial ide ideologies, even celebrating them. Um, and this is this is a, an example of a, a party held at the Africa Museum in Belgium, where attendees wore last year, where attendees wore blackface and colonial garb um, to the event. Of course, the museum issued issued an apology, but it's kind of sorry, not sorry. Um, so I'm going to shift here to some things that I've worked on. Um, some event uh, interventions, and you may see here the 
uh, this very, uh, this, this kind of iconic scene from a Black Panther, which it's finger on the pulse in 2018. Um, so I'm gonna run through some of these, um, some of these, these, this work. Um, so my work at the Penn Museum's New African Gallery is that exhibition um, at the Institute of Contemporary Art. Um, I'm very briefly going to mention AM and H, and I probably won't get to discuss some of the uh, Bryn Mawr research. But um, so my my work at the Penn Museum and at the Institute of Contemporary Art, and again the the focus for this next book is how can the collection archives uncover, uncover the colonial practices that produced ways of seeing um, Africa that have persistent visual residues in museums. And um, I wanna to point to this photo. This is a photo of um, an Am Amandus Johnson, who this is a, a campsite photo. Um, from 1924, his work um, in Angola. And his story is beyond rich and uh, surprising and scandalous. And um, I, 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 I'm working, um, I'm, uh, I have a publication that will be coming out soon about his, about this history. Um, so I was really honored to be part of the newly imagined African galleries at the Penn Museum under the leadership of the incredible um, Dr. Takufu Zuberi. Um, it was very clear from early on um, that this was not gonna be an exhibition development process like, like any other. Um, from the very beginning, Takufu said that everything we're doing with the new exhibition is about you know, erasing the heart of darkness images um, and the vision of that Westerners often held um, of Africa in the late 1880s and onward. And so he wanted this new exhibition to do what other African art and ethnography exhibitions do, um, but also to be about the history of the collection um, as evidenced by the materials in the archives. And so just to give you a contrast, this is a photo of the, the previous African galleries at, um, at the Penn Museum. And you can see they fall into some of the more traditional ways of uh, motifs of displaying Africa. It's like dark and dusty, and there's kind of reductive old anthropology categories. Um, and so this is the entrance, by contrast, to the to the to the new exhibition um, from maker to museum, and you can even see how in the entrance of the the new exhibition is a new way of seeing Africa, um, a replica of a gate in um, Brazil from Portofino that looks out um, looks out to Africa um, um, from what was once a slave port. In, in Portofino and the artist reproduced it for the exhibition. But in other ways, there, were, there was also a recontextualization of traditional African art, um, um, like, like the quote unquote power figures um, by placing them alongside contemporary art from around the diaspora. So everything in the exhibition was shaken and stirred a bit um, to, um, to create new meanings. And the archival research that I worked on with, with, with students from Bryn Mawr um, made it to the exhibition in more, more and less conspicuous ways, such as in this uh, exhibit um, uh, about um, Benin, um, where one of the letters that uh, one of my students found um, from a, um, the brother of a colonial officer um, who was at, 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 the, at, the, at the Benin um, um, killings. Um, th there's a letter from him that we found that, we, that the curator actually chose to put into the um, exhibition. And then it happens in more inconspicuous ways, uh, mostly through interactive. So you have to kind of look for them, but we did, we included, so here's, you know, we had a, 
a, a helmet mask on the on the on the advertising for this talk. We do have a lot of them in the Bryn Mawr collection, but this is an example of um, the way that they were these this history was embedded into the interactives. Um, another example. Um, and so almost lastly, I will talk a little bit about the exhibition that I did uh, co-curated with Meg Only, um, the amazing Meg Only at, um, at, at ICA called Colored People Time, uh, Mundane Futures, Quotidian Past and Banal Presence. And it was about, it was this three chapter show on how blackness has been constructed in different time periods the black future, the black past and the black present. And the exhibition chapter I co-curated with her looked at how blackness was constructed historically through the quotidian practices of museum anthropology. So this was a great opportunity and challenge to think of how archival objects could be used in a, in a current museum display, a small exhibition in a, in a pretty progressive radical contemporary art uh, museum. And for the show, I honed in on, on some of the histories of a few key members in Penn Museum's African um, collecting history, some that I found most intriguing, um, all from the early 20th century. These are some of the photos that we included on the bottom left. That's um, the W.W. W. Oldman, an, an art dealer. Um, so I also was able to um, I was able to to expand on this these some of these stories in ways that I couldn't um, do at the Penn Museum, um, and and again the story of an art dealer, the story of an anthropologist um, Henry Usher Hall who traveled to Sierra Leone um, with his wife, and his wife kept this interesting illustrated illustrated journal with illustrations of black bodies um, that uh, we also chose to put on display. And then of, of, of course, the, um, the story of Amanda Johnson. And here it is um, in the exhibition. It occupied a small space in a very large wall. So visitors had to approach and look at it closely. Um, and so this Johnson campsite photo, uh, again, really powerful to me. I could speak volumes on it, um, but the so the images the image alone is extremely powerful. Um, this kind of constructed uh, hierarchy um, of uh, on this campsite, and I mean, just from beginning to end, reading the photo itself is 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 powerful. Um, and then I also researched the backstory of um, Amanda Johnson, who led this expedition in the early 1920s, and it's pretty mind blowing. Um, was he an anthropologist? Was he an Africanist anthropologist? No, he was a professor of Scandinavian languages that went to um, to Angola to learn um, about the cultures there, but apparently also possibly to steal a cache of diamonds that German scholar left there before him. And this is all documented in museum letters. Um, and, he, and then um, either way, he came back to Philadelphia and had a series of really successful um, lecture tours where he talked about Africa. And those lecture tours actually provided him the capital and the funds to open his own museum of Scandinavian heritage here in Philadelphia. You sometimes can't make this stuff up. All right, I'm almost there. We have this, I'll just mention, you know, I won't go into it, but participating in the, um, how to address the Teddy Roosevelt statue was really important to me and, and very different from when I worked there from when um, I came back there a couple of years ago to help them, help them think about how to, to, to deal with this. Um, but, you know, just also my commitment to helping museums think about how the images they are aligned with um, and that they authorize may represent ideals that alienate some non-white audiences. Um, quite, it's almost quite that simple. 
All right. So in closing, I believe that working in museums and in anthropology, we have to keep our hands on our history um, and train our students to do so. So as, we, as we've seen at AMNH and at the Penn Museum and, and also my work at Bryn Mawr, I know that excavating museum histories and objects are challenging, but liberating and politically powerful. And for me with this work, I personally hope that in some ways putting whiteness on display in subtle ways in exhibitions about Africa, we can reveal the production of symbols and semiotics uh, used in creating a, a heart of darkness, white racial fantasy, so that we can begin to radically undo it. Thank you. And much thank to, to folks at Yale and the Penn Museum. Um, ICA, Bryn Mawr. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that, Monique. That was wonderful to see. I'm going to do the clapping so that you're not Yay. Zoom voiding, but everybody's clapping. Um, right, so I just wanted to say thanks on behalf of everybody who was able to see that and I get to start us off with a couple of questions for you. And then I can see we have a number of questions from people who are in the audience as well. So um, I might as well just jump in. I'm, I'm an anthropologist. I'm here at Yale in your old department um, doing my anthropology thing and I'm finding myself having to think a lot more about the critical aspects of, of the sort of science that I do. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see you talk about these issues. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering in your experience, what, what has anthropology done differently to kind of um, move beyond some of its more sordid past histories? And for people in the audience who don't know, everyone who works in anthropology has to engage with a museum in some fashion or another. And frequently we collect objects that end up in museums, sometimes they're in the collections that the public never sees and sometimes they're part of these displays. And um, so we have, as anthropologists, actively contributed to some of these racialization stereotypes. And I would just like to ask if you had some ideas about how far we've come, um, what's changed, and, and maybe some of the places that we really need to take the discipline in the future to do better. Well, that's no small question, Jessica. Um, <laughs> Look, I think, and, and, and anthropology and anthropologists are not a monolith. I mean, there are people doing great work and there are people not doing great work. And, and on in terms of kind of being more attentive to um, the politics of, of anthropology, um, I think that anthropology like museums is, has had a crisis of identity. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's not, anymore, just white people going out to study others. And I think that, um, you know, there are many more uh, departments doing like engaged anthropology or slightly more political anthropology are just calling upon yourself as, a, as an anthropologist, and I do too, thinking about what work you're doing and why and how it's received. Like me working in Kenya was also, you know, I'm an outsider. So just being mindful and attentive to these politics and, and owning it and owning it in your work, the questions you ask and the way you teach your students is one start. Yeah. Well, I want to second the thanks and the clapping and that wonderful answer that's that start to address kind of like the issues that that were so obviously needed to be grappling with many years ago. And I'm a vertebrate paleontologist, but I think a lot about how we um, display objects and in Monique, I'm thinking about once we make visible these stories of how objects came to be in museums then how do we still make them spaces of inclusion? Because we make visible that these objects have these ties with oppression, um, with everything that you've just talked about, right? Um, then how do, we, how do we still make those spaces of inclusion? 
what are ways that you've seen to do that? Thank you. And it is hard. And I don't think that that, um, that that inclusion of archival history is appropriate for every museum. For example, we could do that at the Institute of Contemporary Art that has a very, a, a limited audience and a, a more, gosh, what word can I use to get myself in trouble? But um, uh, uh, they, they take on a lot of savvy and difficult political issues. So mm -hmm. people are ready to go there. It's not a children's museum. I mean, right. they do things for that. Um, so it is, it was much harder, you know, at the Penn Museum. I mean, I learned so much. We wrestled with so much in thinking about how to, 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 um, display these are these histories, these painful histories, and and still yet do the job of a museum in educating their you know the thousands of diverse school children that are going through. And do you want them to see this photo of of slavery um, of, of a child in bondage right when you know they they walk around a corner? No, you know so. We have to be very sensitive and very careful for, for God's sake, the whole point of this reimagining of the African galleries was to make it feel more inviting. Um, so it wasn't just for white people to say, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, bad things happened um, in terms of the history of, of African objects and museums. It's also to um, you know, to 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 edu edu educate everybody about the cultural like dynamism and and um, if dare I say beauty of of, of African Af some African art and showcase the aesthetics as well as the um, you know the, the 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 cultural histories and cultural presence um, and so. It was a it was a tough balance, and yeah, I mean, gosh, what was that exhibition at the Royal Ontario Museum? I think it was like Into the Heart of Darkness. Like you can go really wrong when you just <laughs> want to to put on an exhibition of like colonial like images. So, um, so no, and I learned so much of the process. They had a phenomenal um, um, uh, exhibition team and the head of uh, exhibitions, Jessica, uh, who, who is uh, fantastic at interpretation. Um, and yeah, it was a challenge and I learned a lot from it, so. Well, I'm going, we're going to Jessica with the first audience question, but I want to say, I really love how you incorporated the aesthetic, like that these are living, beautiful objects and these have linkages to cultures that one hopes many are still active, vibrant material cultures today in Africa. And I just love how aesthetic that um, image of the Penn Gallery was. So, I mean, aesthetic, but then then like problematizing that with the, with it being this, this interaction with it, the slavery, the history of, of enslaved peoples in Brazil. Awesome. It's so, not an exhibition to photograph. There are so many other instances of that in the exhibition and, and, mm -hmm. and also a new contemporary art, art piece um, that is uh, just all about kind of like collecting debris um, in Africa. It's, 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 it's really powerful. So if I don't say so myself and for my team there, <laughs> Takufu. Own it. Own all it. right, Jessica, over to you. Yeah, I've got a bunch of audience questions here, and I might as well just um, start with the first one, um, which is about Black museums. I don't know if you can see it or if you just uh, rather that I read it to you, but basically they're asking, how do you address colorism or classism issues in the curation of Black museums? So um, if, uh, for example, somebody has been taught to colonize exhibits, um, regardless of their own background. Um, the, the audience member asks, conservative black people do not want to show radical images in museum work and then have been taught to colonize exhibits. So they seek to exclude stories of resistance and the people that in that and that have led many black resistance movements. So I suppose they're just asking, um, you know, if there are differences in the way that you would recommend people to curate museums that focus on black history. Um. 
so first of all, I, I, I know a lot of black museum professionals that engage the tough issues <laughs> um, that aren't conservative um, in some ways. And uh, one of the best things about being here in Philadelphia is I'm part of a community of black museum people and, um, and that, are, that are doing like all sorts of, of radical work. Um, I do think maybe there are ways in which some more traditional like African-American history museums um, might seem to be going away from some more edgy or political issues. But I actually, I don't, I don't see that in Philadelphia, actually. I don't see that the African-American Museum of Philadelphia with their temporary exhibitions. Um, but again, just like my audiences aren't a monolith of Black people working in museums are not, you know, monolith. And also not every museum should be doing the same thing. There are some museums where it's a right to address certain issues and temporary exhibitions. There's some museums where that's not the right fit. It doesn't fit their audience. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, Julia, do you have, do you wanna grab the next one? I'm gonna try to grab a melange of several. Um, one of the questions concerns uh, constructing Africa as a physical or as a geographical space. And I can use kind of some of the verbiage, like uh, the construction of Africa as a geographic entity and unit in museums. So is this, I mean, obviously it's culturally diverse, historically diverse. I mean, so are people starting to pro like problematize that? That's, that's sure. kind of seems to be the heart of the question. And I won't melange that with other questions. I'll just leave that one, yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, like, first of all, like, what is an exhibition of Africa? I mean, that's just an insane <laughs> concept, you know, I mean, with the complexity, with the diversity, with, uh, you know, uh, you know, 53, 54 countries, thousands of languages, you know, what, what, how do you do that? How do you do that in 4,000 square feet? Um, how are museums doing that? Because that's one of the questions as well. Is like how are how are museums really grappling with this today? You know. So, so yeah. I think one option is to not take on the whole continent. But you know, like it's it would be hard to do an exhibition on um, like. Uh, uh, performance are in Johannesburg. Like I, you know, like if, if you're kind of like have the opportunity to stick closer, you know, to, or to give a, a variety of um, um, like displays or, or exhibitions that produce um, different images or uh, of, of, of the continent, but it's, it's crazy. And this is our charge often with anthropology exhibitions, um, you know, I think Africa, it's particularly damn hard because there's just so much, you know? And unless you're willing to continue to reduce it to, you know, um, dioramas of, of, of people in, in the rainforest or in the savanna, that sure makes it easy for you. But if you really wanna do it right, I think are better, let's do it better. Let's not do it right is very hard let's do it better is by um, acknowledging the challenge of addressing a continent that people think of as one <laughs> country, you know, a con some people um, as, a, as, a, as a continent that is complex, that has like so much different like history and politics and philosophy and art and thinking. So yeah, finding ways to address that. And hey, you know, again, to to my horn, not my horn, to Khufu's various horn at the Penn Museum, because I think he 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 really kind of he took on that challenge really, really well. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean I can confirm that that happens a lot for somebody as someone who works in Africa. Um, I will tell people about the specific part of the specific country where I work and 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 they immediately just have to zoom out to the whole continent and make blanket statements about about what goes on in Africa as if it's this sort of entity that is, One that is per separated from everything. They, they're traveling to Africa. I think I'm like gonna jump out a window. I'm like, you know, like, where are you going? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, 
Oh, we've got a, a nice question. Oh, sorry, did you want to? I was just going to also mention, you know, I also learned a lot from my time at the National Museums of Kenya, um, a lot. I'm not, I, you know, I won't go into it, but it was very important to me to add to the complexity of my study of museums, you know, two British museums, the American Muse Museum of Natural History, to include the National Museums of, Ken of Kenya, and that could have been a book in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe it. Um, we've got a lot of questions here about museums from people who work in museums. And one of them that maybe stands out to me as being kind of urgent and timely is uh, one about digital collections. And it essentially is asking, look, with the pandemic refocusing attention on digital access, could you give us any guidance as to possible remediation strategies for the less contextualized collection records or digital exhibitions? So is there a way to deal with this? um digitally that that maybe is an opportunity um or is it problematic especially when it comes to collections where we don't have great provenience for where the objects have actually come from I'm trying to look for the question um so from it, robert number three okay right so um Yes, I mean, one thing we've also learned from the pandemic is that it's great to have collections digitized um, so that there can be future research on them, uh, or present day research on them. Um, you know, and there's always this question of, you know, the digital replacing the authentic object. Um, but one thing I have found interesting in the uh, world of thinking about repatriation is having um, having uh, you know di uh, digital images of objects kind of standing in for um, for for um, the authentic objects that might be returned. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to answer your question, Robert, it is also, yeah, we need to do more of it. Like there's there's a lot we can do in the digital realm. There's a lot more uh, text <laughs> we can give. There's a lot more depth that you can, you can offer. You can allow people to see objects in three, um, you know, in three dimensions um, in ways that you can't always in a museum exhibition. So, um, so yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic and I don't think it will take away from museums. I think we will still have museums. <laughs> well, we have like time for, I think one last question. Monique, if you've looked at them and there's a particular one you wanna answer, there's some on how do we deal with dioramas that I personally wanna know the answer to. There's some other ones on how we talk about objects where the maker is not known. Um, so maybe pick one that you want to, to answer for our last couple moments here. Um, I'm sorry, now I'm just reading through again. Uh, sorry, Julia, would we'll distill what you just said for me again? Oh, I just said, how do we deal with dioramas? That's okay. one. So, and then also, do you like this notion, and melanging questions again, do you like this notion of the idea of labeling art maker not known? Um, instead of unknown, like the premise that we have not yet figured out this maker or how yeah. that's being used to museums. So those are two little mini questions that, that are probably I, big questions. That was one of my students. We talked about that in class. The Penn, the Penn Museum um, chose to say um, artist unidentified just to make a point of, you know, there mm -hmm. was someone as a, and not just like artist unknown. Um, I actually, when I was starting to do this research, I got really interested in um, dioramas in other in other realms of the of museum work, and um, and definitely I was like I was very excited to see this um, to see the work being done on representations of dinosaurs. <laughs> um, you know the politics <laughs> built into the representations of dinosaurs uh, uh, and the reconstructions. You know, so they're totally. maybe not like dioramas in the same, but but obviously how it's reconstructed is going to shape <laughs> how people perceive it. Um, yeah. And certainly with you know, there's a lot of talk with just um, more traditional natural history dioramas, African mammal dioramas, things like this, and the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, 
the idealized like family groups and like you know the the it, it's misleading from the science and probably most scientists believe that you know it's a whole different it's a whole different um uh type of work to do the work of 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 artistic kind of reconstructions right. um as opposed to and it, even with taxidermy but like how do you arrange them um that that all makes meaning and i i did like that the american museum of natural history in their second um uh, human origins exhibit that happened after I researched the older one. Um, they included um, a video of um, they included a video of of how a, a reconstruction was made. So even just like by acknowledging there's a human <laughs> that is making interpretations right. and and then when I would work with students there I would say okay so let's talk about the 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 more or less subjective aspects that go into a, a reconstruction so in you know in bone structure to you know skin color to hair right. to the positioning like there's some more you know um, information that's based on our science <laughs> um yeah. you're still making some choices but the height you know the uh but but you know, there it increasingly perhaps becomes suggested. So even just acknowledging mm -hmm. these are artistic reconstructions, because these are the things people that they stick with people. They're, they're you know? powerful, powerful images. So powerful. So AMNH has done a great job um, in the Human Origins exhibitions, and especially in the new one, uh, the new one from 10 years ago <laughs> <laughs> um, that Rob and Ian curate. But um, but they did a great job, uh, like, and the text and the, 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 you know, the, the there's a huge section on race. Um, but yet people still walk through and, and they also made the dioramas in a kind of a circular uh, room rather than kind of linear. But still people yeah. were saying, oh, dark, light brown, beige, white, you know, it's like, and that's what they're reading. So. Okay, but I am optimistic. I think that what we need to do is create new dioramas, Mom, new images. Oh. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm oh, sorry, I had to mute out my son. Um, uh, I think we need to create new types of images, new images of what it means to be a modern human. Um, we need to um, uh, complicate the story of how these visual um, reconstructions are made because it's if you're thinking that what you see in the Hall of African Mammals with the taxidermied animals and what you're seeing in the Hall of African Peoples with these 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 poorly done mannequins yeah. um, and what you're seeing in the hall of uh human evolution are of the same <laughs> you know like these are real uh, yeah. then you know that's that's not good so i think just more explanation it's a line you know this is a construction it's an artistic construction how would you imagine if you had this evidence how would you recreate you know this this scene I know that students find that so powerful with dinosaurs. They're like, that's not what it really looked like. You know, just historicizing that. I love the idea of videos where you show the process, the discussions between artists and scientists that go into dioramas. Super cool. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I need to turn it over to our uh, um, to to Francis to kind of close us out here. Um, thank you so much, Monique. Thank you. And thank you. I'll do the clapping for the for many participants. Thank you. I'm clapping too. <laughs> I, thank you, Monique. I I can't help but think there isn't one single person in our audience that has not applauded your critical and outstanding accomplishments. And I also have to say, I can't imagine you have a huge audience wishing you continuing success in making your headway. It's just so timely and so important. Thank I would you. also like to say thank you to Dr. Clark and Jessica Thompson for 
such meaningful participation. It means a lot in these presentations. And lastly, dear audience, thank you all for coming. Um, I would like to add one last note from the Peabody that is, and I would say, please follow us on social media or sign up for our mailing list through the connect box on our homepage, because we sure do wanna be sure that you know about all our other upcoming online events. And thanks again to everybody who has been here with us.